Hi, and welcome back to the Potter Shop Hollow Tree Farm <laughs> and Portable Sawmill. Well, this sawmill right now is pretty portable because it's sitting on the back of my truck. And I just now picked up a brand new HD38 Norwood. And this is going to be a game changer. The HD38 is a totally redesigned sawmill. And it has some features and capabilities that I have not seen on any other sawmill anywhere. So, the first thing we're going to do is to find box number one. And it's the one that says open me first on the side, by the way. The first thing is the owner's manual. And this takes you absolutely step by step on how to assemble your sawmill. And it's a daunting task. You've got a lot of nuts and bolts, a lot of parts that have to go together just right. But if you just take your time, follow the manual step by step, when you're finished, you're going to have a terrific sawmill. So trust me. The other thing that's important is your Norwood owner edition hat. Very own. Yes, you're one of us now. This one, I've, I've had about eight years since I put my HD 36 together and we've been out a lot of years a lot of weather a lot of board feet of lumber but but this hat looked exactly like this one when I first got my first sawmill so I am going to set the new one aside for special occasions and just wear the old one uh, from my general all-around hat I I'm kind of proud of this old hat. I've cut a lot of lumber with that thing on my head. And it helps to have a trash can handy. You are going to have some plastic bags and things that you want to keep out from underfoot. And that'll just help keep your work area clear and help you stay organized. So I think we're ready to start putting this thing together. Assembling the frame will go more smoothly if you have all the tools on hand before you start. Here's what you need. A level, carpenter square, grease gun, grease rags, pliers, vice grips, an adjustable wrench and a slot screwdriver, a jack, a paper clip, no kidding, 9 16 inch wrenches. You need open end, socket, and a deep socket, plus a 3 inch socket extension, a hammer, string, wood shims, a box cutter, tape measure, a couple of 3 inch C clamps, and an impact driver will really speed things up for tightening the nuts and bolts. And a right angle drive for it will make it easier to get in the tight spots. For the trailer build, you'll also need a chainsaw file, wire strippers, a couple of wiring butt connectors, 3 quarter inch and 13 16 inch wrenches, and a 7 8 inch wrench, preferably on a 1 half inch or better yet 3 quarter inch drive socket wrench. And as an option to protect the wiring, 20 feet of Schedule 20 half-inch PVC tubing, two 90-degree elbows, and a coupler. And if you don't have a grease rag handy, you can always just grab the nearest kitty cat. Keep track of all the loose wires that you pull out of the boxes. The staples can find themselves uh, embedded in tires and cause all kinds of... Uh, calamity not to mention in your foot so coffee can for hardware not a bad idea all right box 17 yes ah nuts and bolts bunches of them and some other stuff too that uh, uh we'll figure out where that goes later but for now we'll keep them in the box Okay, a trick that I learned when, when uh, opening these bags, rather than slicing across the top, if you would just make a slice crossways, like that, you can get the nuts and bolts out easily. This is handy to have just an empty box. You can keep them in that, and that helps you keep them sorted and all together. So.
All right, so number two should have the cross bunk brackets. Try saying that three times real fast. It'll look like this. And, it'll have, and it also has some other parts that go in the carriage later. So keep them in this box. Don't lose them. When you build the, uh, the carriage and the saw head, you'd be glad you have them. And our cross pieces should be in box number three. Sounds like they might be. Okay, so put a box behind it for support. Look at the picture and it'll make sense. The other one faces the other way on the back side. And we're ready to do our first nut and bolt. When iron comes in contact with wood in a lot of species, uh, white oak probably the worst, it reacts to the acid in the wood and leaves a blue stain where it was in contact. These end caps are stainless steel, which is actually a nickel alloy, and it doesn't react with the wood. So we'll go ahead and put these on now. The frame is the foundation for your sawmill. So I've laid out the cement pad with two parallel chalk lines that are 34 inches apart. Then I've marked the chalk lines at 48 inch intervals, which will be the center points for each of the uh, cement blocks. And then that'll be our platform for building the frame. Then, because I don't like the idea of scratching up these nice new galvanized frame members on the cement blocks, I'm going to lay out some uh, about 3 8 inch uh, OSB. And we'll just take our level and go between all of the blocks in both directions. And the whole idea behind that is that level gives you the reference. So if when you're setting up the track and you're getting everything trued up. If it's level, then you know that everything is going to be in the same plane and it's going to be flat. <laughs> well, I've got the truck unloaded and all of the parts for the frame, including the trailer package, sorted and staged and ready to put together. The carriage will come later as a separate video and we'll just build that right on top of the frame once we get the frame done. We'll start out by centering the six splice plates on the block supports. We've got the edge just hanging over the edge of the block, so they're sitting flat, and the large flange with the hole in it is facing inward toward the other splice plate. Frame rails overlap the splice plates with the ends centered on the blocks. But what we're going to do is just come in with our um, inch and a quarter flange bolts from the bottom side up and the flange nut. You can see the edge of the splice plate right here, and they're going to fit together. For the stationary mill, all the bolts go from the bottom up, skipping the first four pairs of holes, the four pairs where each cross bunk bolts in, and the last four pairs of holes. Then for the bottoms of the splice plates, they go with the carriage head inside through the splice plate 
and then we'll add the nut to it on the bottom side. Now the cross pieces, the cross bunks are going to go right here in the center. And they'll bolt onto these eight frame members. So we're not going to put those bolts in just yet, but we can still go ahead and do the bottom bolts. So if you're stationary, your bolt pattern will look like this. For a trailer build, skip the three holes where the brackets will bolt in later. It helps to keep track of the holes numbered from the front of the mill towards the back. Cross bunks bridge across the seams in the frame rails. One important thing to remember on these cross bunks is there's a flange at the bottom, and the flange points towards the starting end where you would begin the cut as a sawyer. And you'll also see extra holes on one side. And if the flange is right, these holes will be on the what I call the sawdust side, the non-sawyer side of the sawmill. And the reason you want to make sure to do that is later, if you decide you want to add hydraulics to the mill, they'll bolt on right here and all the holes are in place ready to go for it. Now we're to the tricky part and that is standing that frame up on edge and bolting it to the cross bunks. So I'm going to, be, so I'm going to go ahead and have my bolts ready and my nuts so I don't have to look for them. Stand the whole thing on edge. Support it with my knee and then bring that cross bunk up in place. Line up the holes. And you get that first nut in place, it'll stand up on its own. So I'll run it in by hand as far as it'll go. There we are. There. All right. We'll go ahead and put in the other seven nuts and bolts and uh, move on down to the next one. On the second cross bunk for a stationary mill, all eight bolts go from the outside in. For a portable mill, the outside four bolts go from the outside in, and the middle four bolts go from the inside out, so you can attach the jack stands. On the third cross bunk for a stationary mill, again, all eight bolts go from the outside in. But for a portable mill, there's one bolt that goes from the inside out to hold the fender bracket. Attach the fourth cross bunk with just four bolts. For a trailer build, they go from the inside out, and for a stationary build, they'll go from the outside in. And that'll hold it. So we've got the four cross bunks on the sawdust side, 
and you just repeat that process on the Sawyer side and it's going to start looking like a sawmill frame. Hey old fella. The end frame on the finish end of the mill slips into place with the flanges on the inside and the bolt holes lined up with the frame. And we can drop in our four bolts on each side. There we go. The end frame of the starting end of the mill requires a spacer plate between the frame and the rails since there's no cross bunk there. The cross brace stiffens up the frame. An easy way to install it is to bolt the top slots of the brace to the bottom holes on the frame just enough to hold it while you attach the other end. Now here's the tricky part. We need to have nuts on the back side as spacers be between these ridges to make it stand out the same amount so we can slip it in and a paper clip makes a really good positioner. Get it close. And then lift it into position and hold it in place with the 9 16 inch wrench while threading the bolt in. Pop out our bolts. There we go. Pull the track up, make sure our holes are aligned, and use the same process to install the two nuts and bolts. The top two bolts are a little different because we use a track spacer and run the bolts in. And drop the track spacer in. If you have problems, if sometimes it's hard to get that to slide down in there. And if you run into that and just shim it out a little, there, and it'll drop right in. Once it's in place and you've got a nut on the back side to hold it there, just finger tight. Just like that. Pull your shims out. And tighten the two lower bolts on the outside. Then bolt the other end of the cross brace in place. And the sequence I use is to do the carriage bolts first. That draws everything together this way. And then we'll go ahead and tighten up the side bolts.
And so we want to make sure we first snugged up the carriage bolts and then we then the four side bolts and we have a rock solid cross frame. Installing the cross brace for the trailer package is a little more complicated, but the idea is the same. We'll just put in a couple of bolts to hold this end of the cross brace up while we attach the other end. Then run the bolts into the two lower holes from the inside and thread on a nut just so that the top of the nut is even with the end of the bolt and pull the bolt back so the nut is against the frame. These nuts are going to act as spacers between the ridges of the corrugation. Keep the slots in the brace and the holes in the track frame lined up as you lift the brace in place. Now we can run those bolts in and we may need to hold the nut while we turn the bolt from the back side. So we're going to go ahead and tighten these nuts and bolts down right now. We're going to come in with the bolts on the top side. And we slip in the spacer plate. It's a pretty tight fit, so I'll just drive in some wedges to space it out a bit. And we can drop in our spacer plate. There, easily done. And that plate can actually still slide, which is a good thing. Because we're going to need to have everything brought up tight when we put in the jack stand. And of course, do the same for the other side. Now I've learned through trial and error, mostly error, that once a jack bracket's bolted in place, there is no way to slip the jack in place. So you might as well save yourself the trouble by taking the jack apart and slipping it into the bracket before you bolt it onto the frame. More nuts again, finger tight. Reassemble the jack and use it to lift up the frame just a little, pushing the bottom plates up tight against the frame. Then install the carriage bolts through the bottom of the frame and thread on a nut. You don't have a whole lot of thread, so that's why I'm pulling these plates together with the jack the way I am. And we're going to start by tightening down the bottom carriage bolts. Now we'll tighten down the bottom two, and to do that, we're going to have to slip in our 9 16 wrench from the side. Now we can come in and tighten up the top nuts. Finally, we want to go ahead and drop the frame back down so it's resting on the blocks again. The other side goes together exactly the same way. The track lies in the groove between the rails and the splice plates. The ends of the four foot sections are even with the splice plates, leaving two feet on each end, which we'll assemble later. And it's important that the bolts go from the outside in, so the head of the bolt is on the outside. And later, when you install the carriage, you've got the bearings that ride underneath to hold it on the track. That gives you clearance uh, for those. The two foot flange rails hold the end sections of the track in place. A carpenter's square is a good way to make sure that the sawmill frame is square. You can definitely see a gap right in here. So that tells me the whole frame needs to be shifted. It doesn't take much. Ah, much better. Now we'll make sure that the track is straight and level.
stretch a string tight between two C-clamps, one at each end of the track, then put a nut under each end of the string. Check the center of the track with a third nut. It should just fit between the string and the track. In this case, the center of the track is bowed up, so we'll shim up the ends until the track is level. Ah, oh, there we go. Just absolutely perfect. Right straight on. Now, we'll do the other side of the track. Use a C-clamp to close up any offset between the splice plates and the frame while you tighten the frame bolts. And I'm not too worried about this offset in the track because when we tighten those bolts, that'll draw them up and they'll be perfectly true. Start by tightening all the carriage bolts on the bottom of both sides. You'll need to move the blocks to get to some of them. Then tighten down all of the side frame bolts, but don't tighten the track bolts just yet. Close up any gaps between the track sections. Then tighten the track bolts. These bolts not only hold the frame together, but they give it its rigidity as well, so it's critical that they all be torqued down adequately to do that job. The instructions call for 40 pound-feet minimum torque on these bolts. I don't see any harm in giving it a little bit more, so I have the wrench set to 45, and we're just going to go, in this case, uh, it'll click when it gets to the desired torque. You don't need to worry about the track bolts, just the ones on the frame. And we're just going to go down the track and get them all set. The end stops go into each corner of the sawmill and they keep the carriage from running off the end of the track, which is uh, something you want to avoid. And it just slides in, slips down, your bent pin runs through the hole, goes through the frame, secure it with the hairpin, and your mill should stay on track. The bracket for the log dog log rest crossbar simply bolts on anywhere along the track. The opened end brackets go on the Sawyer side of the mill. And I'm going to put it just behind the first cross bunk. And I'm setting this mill up to optimize uh, cutting anything from 8 to 12 feet. But we're not going to put these on real tight because we might change our mind and want to move it later. The second notched bracket on the same side, the operator side of the mill, is coming in uh, just ahead of the third crossbar.
The closed end brackets go straight across from the open end brackets on the sawdust side of the frame. Bag number 13 has the parts for the log dog and the log rest couplers. Put in the release lever. A little grease for the L handle. A little grease for the slotted screw. And the nut. And there's your two log rest couplers. Okay, so it looks like the log rest goes together something like this. The roller should turn freely and the wheel cap should pivot to lock in place. Now for the log dog couplers. The log dog moves together pretty quickly. That nylon insert will hold it in place. Handle's free to pivot. You can see that cam handle moving that pick in, and that's what bites into the wood to hold it in place while you're milling it. All right, so on the crossbar, you're using this pair of holes for the reference, so they're horizontal. And our log rest goes on first, just like that. And then the log dog goes on, slides in right behind. It's a little different from what they show on the instructions, but I like to have them straight across from each other instead of offset. Uh, you can go either way. Okay, so we're going to just slide it in, drop it in, line up our holes, and uh, put in a pin. And hold that in place with a hairpin. And put our 3 8 by inch and a quarter bolt. Get it started. We're going to just drive it in snug. There. All, that, all we need is just enough to hold it. The log dog should just slide freely on the crossbar. So adjust the coupler to where the adjusting bolt just bottoms out and then back it off, oh, maybe an eighth of a turn. Then hold the set screw with the screwdriver and tighten down the lock nut. And give it a final check to make sure it slides freely. All right, we're ready to put the log rest in place. And before I do that, notice that there are three holes that uh, take pins and they hold it in place while you're towing the sawmill and this top hole here is covered up by the sticker so you need to cut that away so you can get the bolt through it okay so to install it you're going to raise the handle up all the way put it in place and when you let and when you release that handle there's a tab that catches these teeth and it'll hold it in place and you can lower it by lifting the handle and it'll drop that you can raise it and lower it easily and to raise it that tab inside acts like a ratchet that holds it in place pretty much the same with your uh, log dog we'll set it in place log rests 
should be perpendicular to the cross bunks when the log is pushing against it. That way, when you're making your second slabbing cut, you can have that log rolled up tight against it and you know that you are going to make a cut that's perfectly square to your first cut. So to do that, there's a couple ways. A uh, quick and easy way is with a carpenter's square and a good straight flat piece of wood. Lay it across a couple of cross bunks. Bring the log stop all the way up. Put the square to it. And you can see probably behind it here, there's quite a gap. So that means we need to adjust that log rest forward so it lays perfectly flat against our carpenter's square. Our adjustment is down here. And that takes a 9 16 inch wrench and a screwdriver. Um, so we'll back off the nut a little and use a screwdriver to turn that slotted bolt in, in this case. And I believe that's got it right there. Going to hold the, uh, the slotted bolt to keep it from turning. Tighten the nut to lock it in place. And we'll make one last check. And it's a good time to install the other four trailer jacks. Here's a quick review of the process. The mounting studs require six two and a half inch threaded rods and six flange nuts. Be sure to use the plain flange nuts. You'll need the ones with the nylon inserts later. Helps to sort them into separate containers. Thread the nuts about a third of the way onto the bolts. studs go into the three holes on each side, marked stud, and you want the part that's about a third of it inward. So it about as much bolt sticks out as sticks out uh, from any of the other normal bolts. And then we'll put a nut on the uh, other side of it. There. That'll give us something to hang our bracket from. So we'll tighten up one, kind of in the center. Center of the other one. And we'll hold it in place. Tighten down. There. And that's exactly what we want, is for that fender to just slip in place. Then when we're traveling, we can put some pins in to hold it, and we won't throw rocks and break other people's windshields. The carriage brackets bolt on the same as the fender brackets. You may need to adjust them after the sawmill is assembled. 
Pull the fenders off so they're not in the way while you install the axles. The rear axle hanger mounts on the bottom of the frame 44 and a half inches from the rear of the trailer frame. Be sure to install the plastic spring bushing. You want to make sure that you're using your grade 8 bolts, the gold ones. And I like to put a washer on each side. If you do that, you may have to provide some of your own washers. I think Norwood only intended a washer on the bottom side. Make sure that you use the nut with the nylon insert. Get our thread started. Don't tighten the brackets yet. They need to be able to move a bit to line up with the axle. The front axle hanger bolts on 62 and a half inches from the rear of the trailer frame. Bolts on the same way using the grade 8 bolts, washers, and nylon insert nuts. All right, we're ready to slide the axle in place. And I put some OSB board under it just so it'll slide better. And we'll line it up, put our bolt in, put the nut in from the other side. and repeat. The axle nuts have three indentations on one side. They distort the threads to give the nut more grip on the bolt. Start the nut on the plain side and it'll thread on easily until it gets to the tabs. You will need a wrench after that. All right, the bolts turn out to be uh, 13 16 and the nut to three quarter. So, I've got one of each here. The bolt has ridges in it that bite into that bracket when you draw it in. And that keeps it from turning and trying to come out. And the idea is to tighten the nut on the back side to draw that bolt in just to where the head of the bolt is flush with the bracket. And that's all you need right there. And I'm going to raise that up a little bit. The rear axle springs bolt on with the shackle plates to allow the axle to pivot on the springs when you hit a pothole in the road. Sometimes you just need a bigger wrench. A three-quarter inch socket drive is perfect. All right, and don't forget we left these brackets loose so we can adjust them to the axle. And uh, we don't want them falling off, so we'll go ahead and tighten them up. Then, tighten down the axle hangers on the other side. And that is probably the hardest part of the whole trailer assembly right there, is hanging that axle. And you can see by using the jacks and getting everything adjusted to the right height so the holes lined up, not too bad. I'm going to hold off mounting the wheels for now so I can continue to build the mill close to the ground. But I will put on the lug nuts so I don't lose them. And that completes the axle assembly. Well, I guess I messed up 
and drag this cross brace against another piece of metal while I was unloading the pallets. Pylon Orange Pumpkin Gloss, and that's the color I assume, not the flavor, is an excellent match for Norwood's Orange. Feather it out a little and you can't tell the difference. The tongue receiver bolts to the cross brace and the front end frame of the mill with inch and a quarter grade 8 bolts, washers on both sides, and nylon insert nuts. Then tighten them all down, except one, which will attach the ground wire for the light. Trailer lights have always been a mystery to me. I don't understand how they work exactly, but they do if you follow the instructions. Green and brown is going to feed down what they call the curbside of the mill, and the yellow and brown are going to be on, they say, the driver's side. Probably the easiest to remember this for you people uh, who are in the airplanes and boats is that green is going to go on the starboard side as it's going down the road and yellow is kind of like red and that's going to go down the port side. Now be sure to string the wires through the center hole in the front of the frame or you'll have to undo the wiring and start over. Ask me how I know. Leave about 58 inches of wire in front of the mill so you'll have enough wire to reach your vehicle's light connector when the trailer tongue is extended to the towing position. And what we're going to do is just keep the wiring as much up and out of the way as we possibly can. You're going to have logs falling on it and sawdust against it and all kinds of nasty things. So we're going to give it the best possible chance of uh, staying intact. I run all my trailer wiring through half-inch PVC tubing. The sawmill frame will take two 10-foot sections, a couple of 90-degree elbows, and a coupler. There's plenty of wire to run it all down one side of the frame, and it fits perfectly between the top of the cross bunks and the frame. Do this, and you'll never have to worry about those wires again. The taillights need a good ground to the trailer frame. Just to make sure, I'm filing the powder coat off the edges of the mounting holes with a chainsaw file. Cut 24 inches off the yellow and brown wire. You'll need this to extend the ground wire later. Run the wires to your lights. Remember to run them through that mounting hole first, and then connect up to the lights. Okay? That way, when you bring it back in, everything will sit flush. Right, or what they call the curb side in the instructions, goes on the, the right side of the trailer. You can tell the right hand turn signal pretty easily because it's clearly labeled RH for right hand, and it says stop and turn green. So that tells us that we are on the correct side. We've got the green wire, and we'll hook it up. Strip off about a half inch of insulation. Twist it up real well. You put the green wire on one of the top two holes on the green side and the brown wire on either of the top holes on the brown side. And it's spring loaded and that wire isn't really hard enough to push against the spring and make it work. So what you can do is take a paper clip and push in on the little hole just underneath. And that'll spring that contact out. And then that wire will just slip right in.
and when you take your paper clip out, it'll be secure. Thread on the nuts, tighten them down, and we got our lights mounted. So slide the tongue in place, put the hitch in place, and bolt it to the tongue with a half inch by four inch bolts and nylon insert nuts. And we'll snug them down. The safety chains keep the mill attached to your vehicle so it doesn't go rolling down the road on its own in the unlikely event that the coupler comes off your trailer hitch. Now it should hold it. Grounding the frame gives you good contact between the mill and the towing vehicle and it lets you remove the tongue without disconnecting the ground wire. Remove the loose bolt from the frame and file away the powder coating on the inside of the grounding hole for good contact. Bolt the ground wire to the frame and the tongue receiver. So, in the towing configuration, the tongue comes out until the holes line up on the receiver. Drop in your pin. The ground wire is too short to reach the vehicle connector when the tongue is extended to the towing position. So, slice in the 24-inch yellow wire you just cut off to make it longer. I'm using heat shrink butt connectors, not included. Now with that splice in the ground, it will reach from the frame to the end of the tongue to the coupler and have a little bit of uh, wire left over just to make sure that it will reach the uh, connector on your vehicle. Well, it took some time and a lot of nuts and bolts to put this thing together. But if you did it right, you'll have a rock solid frame for Norwood HD36 V2 sawmill or their new HD38. And on the next video, I'm going to build an HD38 right on this frame.